Oh, so uh, just during that last song, Microsoft decided it would update our computer for us. So, yeah, thank you very much, Bill Gates. At one time I thought, you know, they would, the Antichrist would come out of uh, Microsoft. Actually, once I was sure it would come out of Comcast, when I tried to get out of Comcast, I was sure the Antichrist would rise out of Comcast, but then I decided they were too disorganized. So now, right during our church service, unless you have computer hacking ability on the level of Edward Snowden, you can't stop them from shutting your computer down in the middle of your church service. We'll get that figured out. We'll get our hackers going on that. Years ago, I go to Eastern Washington University, and I'm a freshman, sophomore, going to school over there, and I took a philosophy class. And I had been going to church since, I don't know, I was a little kid, then quit going. Somewhere around my sophomore year, started going to church. And so I'm a, you know, kind of young, fresh-faced, you know, believer in Jesus, going to college to learn and get my degree and that kind of stuff. And I sit in this philosophy class where we talk about the existence of God, whether God exists or not. And uh, decidedly, the philosophy professor was anti-Christian. He was anti, uh, just about anti-everything except his own intellect. And uh, one of those professors, I'm sure those of you who've gone to college, you've like, I think I had that guy. Uh, so you've sat in those classes. So at one point, and I don't know what sparked the conversation, like how it came about, but at one point, one of the students in the class who was also a Christian spoke up about Jesus and the power of the, the resurrected Jesus, to which he scoffed and in a mocking way said, well, most scholars don't believe that he was really resurrected, you know. Now, here's a little clue. Whenever you hear the words, most scholars, that's somebody's way of saying, my team is smart, your team is stupid. Right? That's what they mean when they say that. And so he said, according to the scriptures, Jesus was pierced in the side and blood and water came out. And everyone knows a dead body does not bleed. Therefore, they took Jesus down off the cross too soon and they placed him in the tomb and he wasn't actually dead. And in the coolness and dampness of the tomb, he revived and he came, he never, he had never really died. He revived and he came out of that tomb pretending he had been resurrected. And so Christianity's fake. You know, and of course, when you're the professor and you have the power of the class, I'm looking around the room and all these big wide eyed students are like, wow, I can't believe that. Hey, he's right. He must be right because dead bodies don't bleed. Jesus never rose again from the dead. And fortunately, I had read some books about that time in the back row, me in the back row. Excuse me, sir. Right? What about? And today, as we study the Gospel of Mark, we've been studying Mark for some time at, here at the Gathering House. We're going to look at some of those, excuse me, sir, what about? What about this? What about that? What about this other idea? Because we're finally at the place, chapter 16, where we reach the resurrection of Jesus. Last Sunday, we talked about the crucifixion, and uh, we've been kind of studying this whole thing. So if you've got a Bible, uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 16. And uh, we supply some blue and white ones like this on your uh, tables around you if you don't have a Bible of your own. And you can uh, grab one of these and share it with a friend, uh, look it up. And so Mark uh, chapter 16 is what we're going to be going for here. And the page number, uh, if you're going to use one of these, is page 696. Oh, I'm going to pray just for a moment. Lord, pray that your Holy Spirit would be here present in the room with us, that... Uh, it is really not by intellect and power and might that we learn these things. It's by the power of your Holy Spirit. And when we go, aha, and we see things we never saw before, when we say, oh, I get it now, that's not us being smart. That's you revealing yourself to us. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and give us a bunch of aha moments today, that we would hear you speak, that our eyes would be open to your truth, that our ears would be open to listen to you, that our hearts would be quickened and enlivened with a passion of following you. Jesus, come here now in your Holy Spirit and be present with us. We ask in your holy name. Amen. I'm going to back up actually to chapter 15, verse, uh, looks like 24 maybe. They keep making the print in these books smaller and smaller. Have you noticed that? Right? Every year I pick up the same Bibles and the print is smaller. I don't know what's going on with that. Okay, so anyway, it was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen clothes, he took down the body, 
wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Okay, let's pause right there. Okay, so a little little backup. So last week, you can actually get on our Facebook page or our website and hear the sermon if you want to, from last week, the crucifixion, the finality of Jesus' death. And here's Jesus hanging on the cross. And we learned that typically someone would hang on a cross you know, somewhere between two to three days. That's how long it took for someone to be killed. To speed the execution up, what they would do is break the legs of the people, actually smash their kneecaps, because on a cross, part of what was happening was a pushing up and a pulling up to get breaths of air, let yourself back down. And so when they smashed your legs and broke them, you could no longer push yourself up and you would slowly suffocate over a few more hours. So if you'd been hanging on the cross for a while and they wanted to speed up the death process, they didn't just kill you outright, they broke your legs smashed him with a giant mallet like a sledgehammer, and then they knew that, okay, now it's only going to be a couple of hours and he'll suffocate to death on the cross. That's what they did to the guys on either side of Jesus because they wanted to hurry and speed up their death because the sundown was coming, and as soon as sundown hit, it was a new day for a Jewish calendar, and that new day happened to be the Passover, the highest, holiest celebrated day, uh, the highest holiday in the Jewish calendar. And they're like, we cannot have the dead bodies of criminals hanging on a cross on our high holy day. So get these guys killed, get them killed quick, get them down off these crosses. So that's what they did with the guys, the two guys on either side of Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. So to just double make sure, they took a spear and they pierced him up inside the rib cage into the heart to make sure that, well, just in case, let's make sure he's dead. And indeed, blood and water came pouring out. So that was the status. So here they are hanging. The sun is about to set. A guy named Joseph of Arimathea, who's a member of the Sanhedrin, and actually he's mentioned in all four Gospels. You can read about this guy. He's interesting because the council, the Sanhedrin council, they're the ones who actually put Jesus on trial and determined that he should be executed. They were the highest ruling council in Israel. They wanted to make sure he was was dead and gone. But at least some of them, in this case at least one guy, who was a member of that council, was in disagreement with that decision. And in order to respond to it, since he couldn't fight the council, in a very bold way, he goes to Pontius Pilate, the the governor of the whole region, after hours, is able to somehow get in to see him, which means Joseph of Arimathea must have been a very important, very rich person in society, because the governor is going to visit him after hours. And Joseph of Arimathea comes to Pilate and he says, that body you just had crucified this morning at 9 a.m. has already died. I want to take the body down off the cross, but I need your permission to do it. Typically what would happen, as soon as they were dead, all of the bodies who had died as convicted criminals, it was illegal to mourn for a convicted criminal. You could do it privately, but you could not mourn publicly. And so they would take the bodies down and they would throw them into an open pit or open trench near the execution grounds. Sometimes... Important people, rich people, somebody who had some sort of deeper connections, someone would come and take that body and whisk it away, but they had to have the governor's permission to do it. So Joseph of Arimathea, not a relative, not related to Jesus, not having any connection to Jesus that anyone else knows except Joseph himself, who secretly is a follower of Jesus, according to other Gospels, comes to Pilate and saying, I do not want the Lord Jesus to end up in a trench, thrown in there with a common grave with everyone else that later on the birds and the dogs eat. I want to take him. And Pilate, knowing that Jesus has only been on the cross for six hours, is like, whoa, what? He's only been on the cross six hours. This is a three-day process. This is a two- to three-day process. So he's stunned that Jesus is actually dead. And before he says yes to Joseph of Arimathea, he says, I can't say yes after six hours. I'm not believing he's dead. So he actually invites the centurion in who was in charge of the execution and says, can you verify that that guy on the middle cross was indeed dead. Now I ask you, how many dead bodies do you think this centurion has seen in his lifetime? He is a professional killer. 
Not only does he kill people in warfare and in battle, he is a professional executioner. His job is to make sure that the people who are condemned to die indeed die. That is his job. So when Pilate calls him in and says, are you sure that guy is dead? The centurion in charge of it says, yes, I'm sure. And my folks, and he ought to know. He ought to know. And he says, yes, I'm certain. So this witness who was there, not a Christian, not a follower of Jesus, not someone who had any invested interest in Jesus at all, is actually the one who's verifying Jesus died. He's not a disciple. He is Roman centurion. I'm verifying he's dead. That's my job to kill people. I've killed thousands. That guy's dead. I know what a dead body looks like. And so Pilate's like, okay, I guess you can have him, Joseph. So Joseph goes to the cross. He takes Jesus down off the cross and sundown is coming. And according to the Jewish law on the Sabbath, you cannot do work. You can't work on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. Sundown is the beginning of the day. We are a midnight to midnight, but there's sundown to sundown calendar. That's how it worked in those days. And so, um, He's got to hurry up and get this body down, and there's only a limited amount of preparation he can do. Because when that sun sets, if he's still working, it's like, yeah, not allowed. And the Jewish law actually said what you could do. You could wash a body on the Sabbath, you could um, get it wrapped in a linen, but you couldn't do the full uh, uh, embalming process, you couldn't do all the anointing that was needed to be done. You had to do a quick, fast job, you had to come back after the Sabbath and finish the job. And so Joseph, and actually according to the Gospel of John, his buddy Nicodemus, also a member of the Sanhedrin, pull Jesus down and they go and they wash him quickly, wrap him quickly, place him in the tomb quickly. And in John, the Gospel of John, it tells us they wrapped him in this linen and they had some aloes and some myrrh, some spices, because you always wrap the body in these spices. And it says in John, they had about a hundred pounds worth of it. And so they wrap Jesus very quickly, do a rush job, throw him in the tomb, and then they roll this large wheel-shaped stone, it would roll in front of the tomb door and lock it up. Now, typically what would happen in their culture is you would let a body lie on a slab inside what would be a carved-out cave, and it would lie there for one year. When all rotted away, then you would come back one year on the one-year anniversary of their death, you would open the tomb up, roll the stone away, you would go in, and by now it should be mostly bones. And then you would collect the bones, and you would put them in a small little box about, you know, yay big, not very big at all, about two and a half, three feet, just And you'd put the bones in the box, and then you would tuck the box into shelves you had carved along the walls. And this is how a family sepulcher was. So what would happen is you would have the, you know, we would have like the Bryson family sepulcher, where if someone in our family died, they would be laid on that slab. A year later, we would collect their bones, put them in a box, and set them next to great-grandma. And so you would have this whole family, this whole clan, gathered inside one carved-out tomb. That's what you would have. And so pretty, what would happen is sometimes a family would get to a place that's like, well, the tomb is kind of full, and so we need a new one. Uh, all the clan's been being buried here now for seven, eight generations, and everybody's in there, and we're out of room, and we've carved as far as we can. And typically what would happen is somebody in the family would sort of achieve a status of notoriety or power or fame or uh, richness or influence. And so they would carve out a fresh tomb, and they would be able to say, okay, I've always been, you know, like if your maiden name was Smith, right? And now your your new maiden name is, you know, Johnson. Well, I've been in the Smith tomb forever, but now we're going to carve out the Johnson family tomb because that's the legacy we're going to leave behind to the next few generations. So Joseph of Arimathea has actually carved out a brand new tomb that nobody is in. Absolutely nobody is in there because it's going to be the Joseph of Arimathea family tomb, Right? And he will be the lead one in it. And the next 10 generations to get buried will get buried in his tomb under his name because he's the most powerful, most influential, richest person in the family who's leaving his legacy. So the idea that there would actually be something as an empty tomb with nobody else in it was super rare. Super rare. The fact that there was a fresh tomb that someone could go into and put a body in where there were no other sepulchers or body in there is super rare. Joseph of Arimathea has carved this tomb for himself and his family. And he's deciding the very first body that's going to go in the tomb is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to take him down off the cross. I'm going to place him in my own personal tomb where nobody else is in there at all. So he places Jesus in his own tomb and quickly rolls the stone in front of it after he's washed the body, wrapped it in some fast linens, and poured about a hundred pounds worth of aloes and myrrh over the body just to preserve it so that they could come back in a couple of days, roll the stone open, and finish the process. That's their plan. 
And then we're told what happens here, though, is the group of women who had seen Jesus die on the cross, they follow Joseph Arimathea, they follow Nicodemus. They're not going to get too close because they know by the robes that they wear, the power that they have, oh, wait a minute, those two guys are on the Sanhedrin. That's like, it's hard for us to, those are like senators for us. Those are like national senators, high-powered ranking officials, only 70 of them in the entire world, and they rule the Jewish people, only 70 of them. And these are two of the 70. So these women are not going to get too close to those guys because they know it was Jesus was put on trial by those guys and all their friends. So I'm not getting too close to them, but they follow behind and they watch and they see where Jesus was laid. They understand the deal. And then they go back to their Sabbath thing and they have their own personal Passover and they have to wait until the day changes when the Sabbath is over, the Passover is done, and then they can come and they plan on getting to the tomb first and doing the right, the ritualistic rites of the body of Jesus before anybody else gets there. So they're sort of doing this surreptitiously and secretly. And so Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and a lady named Salome and the other Gospels tells us there might have been an even larger group of them. They come with spices. They're going to add their anointing. They're going to do some of their embalming process. They're going to wash the body. They probably didn't see what had happened with Nicodemus and Joseph because most likely their wrapping process and their pouring out was done inside the tomb. And so they had stayed outside. They didn't know what had gone on in there. They just know Jesus' body was placed in there. They watched. They waited a little while. The guys came out, rolled the stone. Okay, we'll go back. Uh, It's Friday night. We'll go back Sunday morning. So here it is Sunday morning, and they're returning. And on the way in very, very early in the morning, it's sunrise. But it's technically the third day because they're sundown to sundown. So Friday's the first day. Saturday's the second. This is now the third day. And on the way in, they're discussing, hey, wait a minute. There's like six of us ladies here. But it takes like eight big, strong guys to roll this door away, to roll that stone away. It's a it's a tough thing to do. And we thought of everything. We had made big plans to do this. We bought the spices. We got the linens. We got this water to wash them with. We're bringing everything to the tomb. And we forgot something, which is how in the heck are we going to roll the stone away? They are fully anticipating to go meet a dead body. There is nothing in their psychology, nothing in their thinking, nothing in their behavior, Nothing in anything that they're doing which says other than they are coming to meet the dead body of Jesus Christ and do the ritual of making sure that it is buried properly. That's where they're at. And you look at all the stories of Jesus, and that's what I had to say to the professor that day. He said, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Wait a minute. I know he was pierced, but are you suggesting that Jesus, who after he had been flogged and beaten... Many times, so much that the scriptures say his face was unrecognizable, that he was then crucified with spikes through his wrists and his feet, and he hung on the cross for six hours, at which time they pierced him with a spear clear up into his heart, and then they pulled him down off of that cross, and they had time to wrap his body in linen and pour a hundred pounds of aloes and myrrh on it, and place him in the tomb and roll a stone away. Are you suggesting that in the state he was in after what he'd been through, he woke up, that with all those wounds, he tore the linen wrappings off himself, got himself out of the 100 pounds of wrap, that he rolled the stone away by himself, he beat up the guards who had been placed there, according to the other Gospels, the Roman guards who were there, and then he walked the several miles to the upper room to appear to his disciples and say, I've risen from the dead. you suggesting that that's more believable. And it was like, that's absurd. That's absurd because all of the disciples would look at that and they'd say, well, he's not dead. He never died. They would have never proclaimed that he resurrected. They would never have proclaimed that he resurrected. They would just proclaim, well, we saw him after he was supposedly executed. But they would not call that a resurrection. The Jesus who appeared to them in the upper room, and when you read the gospel stories like, poof, he appears. He doesn't knock on the door. He walks through the walls. When you see the Jesus who appeared, he comes as a glorified powerful, resurrected, God Almighty. And in some cases, at least a couple of times, they don't recognize Him even when they meet Him and talk to Him. Not even positive, He literally looked like the same guy at resurrection. Somehow His form had changed. On the road to Emmaus, two guys walked with Him, talked to Him, and didn't recognize Him until the very end of their conversation when Jesus revealed Himself. So at some point, I'm looking at this and thinking, no, that centurion was right. There was one thing 100% sure. He placed a dead body on that he made sure that that body on that cross was dead and the body that went into that tomb was dead and the opportunities to make sure there might have been a chance to revive was already done he was dead 
and the stone was rolled in front, sealing it up with a sense of absolute finality. One commentary I read said, the stone, there was a sad finality about it, that this was the end. Joseph of Arimathea, whatever his relation to Jesus, performs the last sad motions of winding up the whole affair. Mark never mentions the grief of the women who watched the crucifixion and this sealing of the tomb. He doesn't need to. His one-sentence picture, stripped of all adjective, is the height of eloquence. There is always a terrible finality about gravestones, but it's a deceptive finality. No stone is ever the last act when it's rolled up against any event in which God has a part. There are so many things in life and in history about which there seems to be nothing to do except to seal them away as this tomb was sealed. Failures, defeats, frustrations. The chapter is ended. The fair beginning we made with God in His name has come around at last to disaster. Roll a stone against it. Close it up. But history shows that God never notices stones. Earth's finalities are never His. He has so many ways of opening closed tombs. Sometimes a child is born and that does it. Sometimes a seed is sown and that ripens and grows. Sometimes a force pronounced dead has a resurrection. We see it in personal life. Many a triumphant victory for the contribution made by a life which was touched there in youth. We see it in history. Rome rolled up a great many stones against the tomb in which it had buried the little Christian church. But we have faith in God, not in stones. When the women asked, who will roll the stone for us away from the the door of the tomb? They were thinking in terms of earthly factors only. In such terms, the question was unanswerable. The stone was too heavy for them. Therefore, it loomed before their minds immovable. It's a type of thinking that so easily besets us largely because more than we realize, we have shared in the secular temper about us. In spite of our belief in God, we tend to look out on the world or on a particular difficult situation as though only mundane factors were at work. And here is the mountainous tone. When will that stone ever get rolled away? So men's minds have run. And the only answer is never, as long as we are looking only at earthly powers. There was no answer to the woman's question in terms of earth. But God had an answer. He has an answer to immovable stones. There is the stone we all come to, the gravestone, as this one was. Who will roll it away, the heavy weight of grief, the feeling that life is crushed beyond restoration? That is a universal question. God has rolled it away. Through the years, men have despaired of rolling away great stones that block the coming of God into the world. In the early 18th century, the condition of Christianity in England seemed to so many Christians to be that of senile decay. The death rattle seemed not far off. And then came an upheaval, a divine springtime. It was called the evangelical revival known as the Great Awakening. It was not on man's schedule, but was on God's. You and I live in a time when people are already proclaiming that. The death of Christianity, the end of Christianity in America, a post-Christian society. Jesus has died. Christianity has died with Him. It is dead for the future. There is no hope in the message of Jesus Christ for a future America. We're hearing that over and over. Proclaimed all the time on the news, on Facebook. It's a stone is being rolled away by a society that wants to keep Jesus in the tomb. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus rolls the stone away and He emerges with power and glory. At a time when we think it's all hopeless and lost, He emerges and says, I came to give them life and life more abundantly. He'll do it for society and He'll do it for individuals. As I was reading through this concept of the whole idea of the resurrection, what's interesting is, is like, what did the disciples say about this whole thing after the fact? What is the importance of the resurrection? Why why does it mean so much? And there's at least three passages that are worth looking at. One is Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, there's this interesting uh, setup where Paul says, and he's writing this very, the very beginning of his gospel, he's writing to people, and he's writing a letter to the people who are Christians in Rome. And he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, chapter 1, verse 1, page 767, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. From the very beginning, the church understood something. All the miracles that Jesus did, someone could say Jesus did. 
When he healed someone, Jesus spoke the words that healed him. When he prayed over people, he prayed and he did that. When he cast demons out, he did that. All of the miracles Jesus did, well, Jesus did. But the single most powerful miracle that Jesus did, he couldn't do because he was dead. The single most powerful miracle was his actual resurrection, which every healing he did, every sickness he cured, every demon he cast out, every issue he ever dealt with, was not near as big as the resurrection from the dead. That's the biggie. All other things get trumped by that. What Paul was saying is, the resurrection is not a miracle Jesus did, it's one the Father did. The Father did that one. And you know why He did it? To prove, this one's my son. This one's unique in all the universe. No other person has been resurrected like this. This is the one I'm claiming and I'm knowing. And I'm raising up as proof that God is saying that He's mine. All the other miracles people are supposed to believe, like don't, can you, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He who's seen me has seen the Father. And Jesus said, I can do nothing except what the Father shows me. Jesus had tried to use words to tell people, when you see me and when I speak and when I teach and when I proclaim things, it is God Almighty Himself telling you. But you know, He didn't look great. He was just an ordinary guy. If you walked with Him down the street for three days in a row, He stunk. You know, He was just a guy. But when He was raised from the dead, everyone could say, wait a minute. That's a miracle God did. And God is saying, by the power of that resurrection, He's proclaiming, this one's my son. This one's unique in all the universe. This one is a kind of human being that has never been before and never will be since. This one is mine. He's me, my my son. That's what the early church understood the resurrection meant. It meant a miracle that God did confirming everything else Jesus ever said or did. The second thing that they realized is what the resurrection of Jesus is the power you and I have for a new life. Turn to Romans chapter 6, page 771. It's a funny little passage. Um, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Paul is writing this letter to this church of people who are basically saying, um, well, since it's all grace, then I can just go live any old way I want. I can do anything I want, commit any sin I want, do any deed I want, actually can commit any crime I want, because it's all grace, God covers it all, and we're good to go. And, and he has to write them, and he says this in chapter 6, verse 1. What should we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with Him in death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Let me summarize what Paul's saying here. He's saying, Jesus died on the cross. Sin was placed upon Him. We talked about that last week. Every sin that would ever be committed, including yours and mine even though we would live 2,000 years later. All those sins were placed on Jesus. And when Jesus died, He died in your place, meaning your sins and your life and the punishment that you deserved and that I deserved died with Him on the cross. The wrath was poured out, the sin was placed in Him, and when He received that wrath from God and that punishment, all the sins were covered of the world. Paul says when we come to the understanding that Jesus did that for us, that's when we actually awaken into a new life. That's when we begin to see, aha, wait a minute, the me who was a sinner, the me who was hostile to God, the me who could not even hear the voice of God because of my sin, the me who was in rebellion to God, who was counted as God's enemy, the me who was hostile and opposed to God, was actually killed and crucified with Jesus Christ. And he's saying that when baptism comes, and this is why the symbol of baptism throughout history has been the immersion in water. And that's how it was in the early church. It was full immersion. And I don't know, something happened over centuries and sometimes we just sprinkle a little water on somebody and say, ah, that'll do. Um, I'm more of a full immersion person because I love the symbolism. It's someone who says, I get it. I understand what Jesus did. And when someone stands in the water, the symbolism is you are being placed completely under the water like being buried in a tomb. Who you used to be is dead and you're going down into the water being buried away. That's what the baptism's representing. It's also got the double 
uh, imagery of cleansing because the water is going to wash you clean. And then you're raised back up out of the water like the old you who was hostile to God, couldn't hear God's voice, didn't know what God wanted, didn't have an understanding of Him, never had any clue what the Holy Spirit was like. That's left dead in the water. Who is raised up is the new person in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was resurrected, you get that power. The interesting thing about most symbols in Scripture, and this was true of the Old Testament tabernacle, God would always say they're shadows of heavenly realities. So like what you do symbolically, yeah, there's an actual reality happening in the spiritual realm that this is kind of representative of. So I, after years of study, have come to the conclusion that when people are water baptized, God actually is doing something in that that's profound and powerful. That there's a transformative change that people get in the act of water baptism that they can't get any other way. And so in this act of baptism, it also symbolizes, because the Scriptures will talk over and over about baptized with water, but they also talk about baptized in the Spirit. The word baptized actually means immersed, immersion, submersion. That's what it means. The translators never bothered to translate that word. What they did is they took the Greek word baptizo, and they just made a brand new English word, baptize. If they'd have translated it, they would have said submersion, immersion, total that's what they would have done if they translated it. The reason they didn't translate it that way is by the time the Bible was being translated into English, we were already sprinkling people for baptism. And he didn't want to mess that up. So they took the word baptizo, transformed it, changed it. We'll just make a new, brand new word and we'll call it baptize. We're good to go. Let the people out there argue about it. But that's what's happening. So here in Romans, he's saying this. Here's the deal. Through the baptism, which I believe is a spiritual force of the Holy Spirit, you are immersed in the Holy Spirit at the moment you come to Christ. And when that happens, every sin you committed is somehow united physically in the body of Jesus that was actually put on the cross. And your sins are literally there. It's not, it's not like a, well, I understand it intellectually. No, a spiritual force. Like your actual sins were on Jesus. And when he died, he died to you. And the you that is that person hostile to God died with him. And now you have this choice. You either say, hey, I accept that, or you continue on as the sinful person and do not accept that sacrifice. But if you accept it, he says, you're raised back up out of the water, and now the Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit is on you. Your mind is actually cleared. You literally can hear the voice of God that you could not hear before. You can understand the things of God you could not understand before. God has done something to change your heart and your mind. That's what he's saying in Romans 6. The resurrection of Jesus is the resurrection of you. Because he was raised from the dead, he was given the power to raise you from the dead spiritually. And... We ain't got time to look at it, but 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I think, um, talks about why people who don't believe in Jesus cannot understand God. Whole, whole chapter's on that. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to those people who say, oh, it's through Jesus. When I get Jesus, I get the Holy Spirit. When I get the Holy Spirit, I fully comprehend God, and I can finally start hearing His voice to me and understanding what God wants me to do. So Romans 6 says, power of the resurrection, that's new life for us. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says the third thing about the resurrection. Not only did it prove He was the Son of God, not only is it the power of change for us to live a new life free from the bondage of sin, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is like the big chapter on the resurrection. Crazy wild, so much going on there, and it's a big long one. We're not even going to be able to get through it. Paul is writing the Corinthian church, Corinth. Corinth was the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire. I've said that before, but some of you are needing to here. It was the wild party town of the Roman Empire. And the little church that was started in the town of Corinth struggled with just about every issue under the sun, from their sexuality to their position. There was one weird thing about the city of Corinth. In most Roman societies, the strata of who you were was locked in. You were where you were, in the, if you were a slave, if you were a freedman, if you were a, uh, your occupation, if you were a nobleman, a question class, it was locked in and there was no movement back and forth in the social strata. You were what you were. That's what you would be till you died. Your children would be the same thing. It was locked down in Roman society. One of the only places in the Roman Empire where people could jump a status and actually move freely up and down the social strata was the city of Corinth. Corinth let people move up and down the social strata. As a con consequence, the little church inside Corinth was always struggling with people jockeying for position. Who's going to be important? Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to be, who's more important than somebody else? So he writes these letters telling him, look, you guys are so whacked. And when you read the whole book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you're like, oh, that poor little struggling, difficult church. There were nothing but trouble, right? And then half the time you read it like, hey, wait a minute, that's me. <laughs> hey, that's me. Um, 
So he gets to them in chapter 15, and they've been saying this thing. They've been saying, there is no resurrection of the dead. Not going to come, not going to happen. It's symbolic language. We don't mean it literally. No one's going to be resurrected. That's what they were saying. And so Paul has to write them, and he says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. And here's, he goes, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. So when you want to know, well, what is the most important message? When you say this word gospel, what is this gospel I hear people talk about? What is it actually? Here it is. First important thing. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So back by the Bible, by the Old Testament prophets, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, again, backed by the Bible, and that he appeared to Peter, that's Cephas, that's who Cephas is, the apostle Peter who denied Jesus. I wish we got that story. That's not in the Bible, you know that? All we know, last thing we hear about Peter is he denies Jesus. We don't hear about him again. Next thing you know, we have this story that, oh, by the way, the early church knew it. Before Jesus appeared to the eleven, he appeared privately to Peter, who had denied him three times after he'd bragged about not being like the other guys. And we don't get that story. It's not recorded anywhere in any of the Gospels because it's a private story between Jesus and Peter. It wasn't meant for everybody else. I wish we got it, though. He says that he appeared to Peter, Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. That's a Christian euphemism for death. Christians don't die, they fall asleep because they're going to be wakened up one day. Then he appeared to James, to be the actual literal brother of Jesus, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Terrible translation. As to one born at the wrong time in history. Would have been better. Because Paul's like a generation after. Like he's way younger than all the apostles. Notice that Paul's saying, here's the most important thing you need to know about the gospel. Jesus Christ died for your sins rose again from the dead, and eyewitnesses were there to see it. He doesn't say the most important part of the gospel is the golden rule. He doesn't say the most important part of the gospel is to know that Jesus did miracles. The most important part of the gospel is that Jesus had this power, that Jesus was a great rabbi, that Jesus could teach. None of that is in here. The single most important part of the gospel is Jesus died for your sins, and He rose again from the dead, and the Bible had said it was going to happen, and it's continuing to say it's going to happen. It's according to the Scriptures. That's what's important. And then he was basically saying to the Corinthian church, because they're running around saying, well, there's no resurrection. He's like, I've seen him. Peter's seen him. The 12 has seen him. Some of those guys have died. But at one time, and I believe it was when Jesus ascended into heaven, 500 people were there to watch Jesus ascend into heaven. It wasn't just a tiny little small group of people who saw this. Here's what's interesting as you play out history. Every single one of the apostles will die a death by execution because of what they believed. Every single one of them. They'd be shot through with arrows. James would get beheaded. Peter crucified. When he was crucified, he said, please crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to die the same death as my Lord. Andrew, he was crucified in the X pattern. Every single one of them. John's the only one who would die of natural causes, but they put a sentence of execution on him. According to history, he was actually thrown in a vat of boiling oil and he came out of it and he wasn't burned. And so they had banished him to the Isle of Patmos where he would write the book of Revelation. And he's the only one who would die an old man. Many other of these early people would die for believing in Jesus. If at any time in the torture, in the execution process, all any of them had to say was, hey, hey, just kidding. I never actually saw Jesus rise from the dead. I never saw him. I'm teasing. I'm kidding. I was lying about it. I was going along with the crowd. At any time, all they had to say was, I'm lying. And they were free to go. Every single one of them instead chooses to be tortured to death rather than deny the truth of what they'd experienced. Now, I can believe one or two of them would have gone crazy if it was a lie and would have believed their own lie and snapped and that kind of thing. But it's pretty hard to fathom every single one of them died a death where they were shot or beheaded or tortured, shot with arrows or whatever, and not at any time all they had to say was, just kidding, and they would have been free to go. But rather than do that, every single one of them died saying, what I'm telling you, is that I've seen the Lord Jesus Christ in the resurrection, and I will die before I deny that. Every single one of them. That should tell you and I something about the truth of this story. Whether it's mythological, or whether, wait a minute, 
These guys were so, I mean, they were serious. Hundreds of them saw Jesus after his resurrection. And then Paul will go on to say this. Uh, it gets complex, but jump down to verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. But He did not raise Him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those, and I don't even understand, those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. The people are saying the whole resurrection of Jesus, mythological story, didn't really happen. It's symbolic spiritual talk for something else. There's no actual literal resurrection of a dead body. It doesn't happen. Paul is just saying to him, are you kidding me? He says, if there's no such thing as a resurrection, if it cannot happen, then even Jesus has to be put in that pool. Jesus wasn't raised from the dead then. Because if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, guess what? There's no power of God on him. His death on the cross isn't big enough and it wasn't working and the Father didn't raise him and all of us are stuck in our sins because his death and crucifixion were not good enough. And guess what? We of all people are most to be pitied. Why? Because we're submitting our lives to this ethical, moral behavior of restriction, of doing what God wants us to do and living the life God wants us to live and treating people the way Jesus wants us to treat them. And that ain't easy. Have you met folks? You met people, it's like, this is not an easy life. I've said it, God, if you've gone to this church for a while, Christianity is not for sissies. It is not for sissies. It is a hard, difficult choices that you make, how you have to be set back, have to restrain yourself, have to, you have to allow God to do things and not try to take control, how you have to love people that are unlovable. Christianity is a hard life. And Paul is saying, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we are most to be pitied because this ain't worth it. He says, but he did rise from the dead because I'm testifying that we aren't lying. We're telling you the truth. We saw him. Paul actually sees Jesus 20 years later on the road to Damascus. Three different times in the Bible it's recorded, Paul saw Jesus. And so he's saying to them, oh no, this is real. This resurrection is not symbolic talk. This is real. And because Jesus was raised from the dead, the interesting thing is, it means we too will be raised from the dead. That's why he uses the term fall asleep, because no Christians ever die. They just go to rest for a while, because at the end of time, they're all raised. And he says this, Skip over to verse 35. But some will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you don't plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as He has determined. And to each kind of seed, He gives its own body. And then He says, not all flesh is the same. There's different kinds. There's uh, different styles. Of, the birds are one and the animals are another. And then skip down. Verse 42, so it will be in the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So the argument people are saying is, well, what about my uncle Joe who lived to 86 years old and was crippled the last 10 years of his life? When he gets raised from the dead, is he going to be a crippled old man in the resurrection? How could that be? That's what they were saying. And Paul has to say, are you guys kidding me? The body that you have now is like the seed. When you put an acorn in the ground, it looks nothing like an oak tree. Nothing like what an oak tree looks like. When you put that seed in the ground, what emerges later is the oak tree. Your body that you have now is the one that gets placed in the ground. At the resurrection, you become the oak tree. It is raised a body that is perishable. Another term is corruption. It is raised a body that feels heat and cold. It is, is I mean, it's put down as a, into the ground as a body that feels heat and cold. It's a body that actually feels weakness. You can break your bones. You can get sickness. You can get disease. You have a body that grows old. That's the corrupted, perishable body. When it's raised, it's imperishable. None of those things will happen. You won't have a body that's crippled. You won't have a body that's blind. You won't have a body that's frail. You won't have a body where the bones can be broken. You won't have a body that can feel the extreme temperatures and 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 die in heat or die in cold. You will have an imperishable, glorious body. That's what the resurrection is awaiting us. I've often thought, oh, hey, you know what? That means in the resurrection, we could go visit a planet where it's 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit and we could lie on the beach 
and see what it looks like to be under a red sky and black sand of a planet that we can't even be in now because it's got nitrous oxide as its gas. But wait, we'll have imperishable bodies. We'd be able to go there, right? So next time you look at the Hubble telescope and you start seeing the universe, understand what Jesus is saying about the resurrection is, yeah, at the resurrection, you'll be able to go there. You'll see it. So when people say, I don't want to go ahead, we'll sit on harps or sit on clouds and play harps. I'm like, you got, you got no imagination. You need to spend some more time looking at the Hubble uh, telescopes and seeing what's going on out there in the universe because God's going to say, here's your playground. You have an imperishable body now. Won't get sick, won't die, won't grow old, won't have broken bones, and it can resist all the heat and the cold, and it can breathe in whatever Jesus decides it can breathe. And Paul was saying that's what's going to be like. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we'll rise from the dead too. Jesus' resurrection means He was the Son of God. Jesus' resurrection means His power is given to us to actually live the life He wants us to live for God. And Jesus' resurrection means the hope and glory of your existence is not in the career path you are choosing now, the car you're driving now, the home you want to have now, the family you have, the children you have. Your hope and your glory is nothing here on this world. The hope and glory and purpose and meaning of your life is what's going to happen at the resurrection. See, that's what it's all about. That's what Jesus was trying to say to all of us. Revelation tells us at the end of time there's two resurrections, one unto life and one unto death. Every human being who will ever live will be raised from the dead. Every single human being ever lived. And they will be judged. If the name is found written in the book of life, it's like, welcome in. You get the new body, the new glory. Here's the universe. Here's all these galaxies. Go explore them. When you think about heaven being eternal, by the way, you think, God, it'll get boring. Again, you need to pay attention to what's happening out there in galaxies. How long will it take you to explore 7 billion galaxies? Right? In your lifetime? (laughs) We couldn't imagine that. In heaven, it'll be like, well, it's a never-ending playground. The second resurrection is unto death. Every human being who has ever lived will be resurrected and sit at the great white throne of judgment, Revelation chapter 20. And if their name's not found and written in the Lamb's book of life, it's like, depart from me, you evildoer, I never knew you. And they don't get to experience that resurrection. This is the gospel we preach. This is the Christianity we proclaim. Jesus died on the cross for your sins to pay a price you could not pay so that He could give you an eternity that will blow your mind, full of love and joy and happiness and hope and power and glory. That's why He came. That's why He did what He did. Now there's a caveat. Those of us who've been doing life know, oh, in the meantime, He's going to leave you here on the planet and He's going to hammer out some rough edges on your character and your personality. And that's going to hurt. But a day will come when He'll give you a resurrected, glorified body and He'll say, welcome into my kingdom, faithful and good servant. And that's what it's all about. And He wants us to proclaim this message to as many people as we can for as long as we're here on earth, as often as we can. Because it's the hope that they will have too to hear it. Why don't you stand with me as we close. Lord God Almighty, King of the universe, Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the Holy One, Mighty God. We're standing here this morning and for some of us, we're bowing with a sense in our heart. You can just feel us bowing down to You as our King and we're worshiping You right now saying, thank You. Because I could not do that. I could not pay for my sin. But You did, willingly. And we're saying, Lord, I need Your resurrection power in my own life because there's still some sins I still battle with and I still struggle with and I don't know why and I need Your help and I need You to give me Your power so that I might be an overcomer. And we say we long for the day and look forward to the day when You come again and there's the great resurrection and we can become new, glorified, the way You want us to be. To enter into the greatest existence in the universe. Some of us, Lord, this morning, we're standing here we're like, I'm not really sure what I believe about all this. And I pray that right now, by the power of Your Holy Spirit, You would quicken minds and You would quicken hearts and You would speak Your truth. And that someone who is doubtful or questioning would know that there's nothing they can do to earn this, but they just simply say, I accept it. But all they have to say is, I believe. That's what Your Word says. I believe. I believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I believe that when He died on the cross, my sins were attached to Him. And I believe that that's the only way my sins can be paid for so that I could stand holy and righteous and pure before God. And I believe that one day He comes again to claim me as His own. And any of us who say, I believe, are in. It's so simple. It's so stupid simple. We don't we we almost reject the simplicity of Your message. But that's it. And so Lord, I pray that by the power of Your Holy Spirit, You open our hearts and our minds to perceive and understand You. May You continue this next week to completely overwhelm us with the knowledge of You. The knowledge of what You want us to do. The knowledge of who You are. And more importantly, the knowledge of the glory that is to be revealed when You come. So that we know why we live for You the way we do. These things we ask 
in your most holy name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you guys.